Today, I want to understand the history of the transmission of the Torah and a little bit about the nature of the transmission and the perpetuation of the Torah, how Torah evolved, how Torah was innovated, how Torah changed from Moses until today. Of course, that's a big subject, and we're going to only take a small piece out of it because it's very vast, but we're going to give the, the outline of how Torah changed and how it developed until today, even though we're not going to cover it until today, but we're going to give the, the, the insight, the big picture of how these things work. Now, the first mention on Perker Avos tells us that the Torah was transmitted from Moshe at Sinai. Moshe gets it from God. And then he passes it off to Joshua. What this means is, is that Moshe passed the baton of leadership, the responsibility of maintaining the accuracy in the perpetuation of the Torah, he passed that on to the next leader of, of the generation, namely to Joshua. And after Joshua got it, of course, he led the people with great skill, and he passed it on to the elders, and the elders to the prophets, and the prophets passed it on to the men of the great assembly. This Mishnah, the first Mishnah of Berkeley Avos, actually covers around a thousand years from the time of Moshe until the beginning of the Second Temple Era, around 350 years before the Common Era. Rambam actually enumerates a more comprehensive list. He gives us the 40 generations, all the way from Moses until Rav Ashi, the compiler of the Babylonian Talmud. Now, over the course of these centuries and these generations, we're going to have change in the Torah, development, innovation of the Torah. We're going to learn about the dynamism of Torah, what changed, and of course, what stayed the same. And I think this will illuminate our subject, Torah in general, the divinity of Torah, and to really understand the relationship with the Torah we have today, the core of which we got from Moses at Sinai, and all the things that were added, and what is the nature of those things that were added, and how does it relate to us today. So we spoke about Moshe already in the past. He, of course, received the Torah at Sinai, and he didn't just get the laws, he got the details, the principles, the nuances, and over the course of the 40 years in the wilderness, he conveyed those principles and those details to the Jewish people. But the Talmud tells us that there were parts of Moshe's transmission that he did not receive from God. The Talmud tells us in the book of Shabbos, page 30a, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe our master, Gazar Kama Gezeros. He decreed several decrees, and he enacted several ordinances. And behold, they are upstanding, they are immutable forever. So this, I think, adds another layer to our discussion of Torah. There were decrees and ordinances that Moshe instituted. He didn't get from God. This was his innovation. Under what jurisdiction can Moshe make decrees? Where is his mandate? So it's important to note that this is a very important principle of Torah, and it's based upon a verse in Scripture. The verse in Scripture in Leviticus 18.30 tells us, You should guard my decrees. And what this means is that there is a mandate upon the leaders of Jewish people to maintain safeguards for the Almighty's Torah. And that's the idea of offense. God says, don't do X, and God tells the leaders of each generation, make sure that X is maintained in its sanctity. And therefore, you have to make a fence around it to prevent that from being transgressed. So we have the commandment to safeguard the commandments by making decrees and ordinances and even new laws to ensure that Torah is being kept in each generation. So if you ever heard the term rabbinic law, this refers to a component of Torah law that mandates the rabbis, i.e. the leaders of each generation, to do things to ensure that Torah is being maintained. And these are collectively called rabbinic law, but they fall into various different categories. You have what's called a decree. And that's the idea of a fence around the Torah. God says, don't write on Shabbos. Rabbis say, don't fiddle with a pen on Shabbos. 
That's a decree. That's to maintain the Torahitic law. The rabbis are required, when they see it necessary, to add, to enact a decree to protect that. And that, of course, is sanctioned by the Torah. That's part of the mandate and jurisdiction of the rabbis. They're told to do it in the Torah. So, in effect, it's kind of grandfathered in by Torah law. That's a decree. What about an ordinance? An ordinance is not a negative decree. It's, in fact, a positive custom. So, an example of this would be Moshe made an ordinance to read from the Torah every week three times on Monday, on Thursday, and, of course, on Shabbat. And the reason why Moshe made this ordinance was to ensure the Jewish people don't go three days without Torah study. And therefore, if you have these three days out of seven where there is communal Torah study, this ordinance ensures that people never get too far away from Torah. And then you have the third component of rabbinic law, and that is rabbinic mitzvos. And these are actually very rare. There's only seven mitzvos that were added, brand new mitzvos that were added by the rabbis that are not reinforcements of existing Torah law from Moshe. But it's important to stress, even though we call it rabbinic law, and we don't consider Moshe to be like a rabbi per se, even though he's called Moshe Rabbeinu, but he's not from the era of rabbis. He's, of course, the original, the OG, the one who gave us the Torah. Yet already with Moshe, we have decrees and ordinances that he gave. Now, the Talmud does not give us an exhaustive list of Moshe's decrees and ordinances. We have to go throughout the Talmud to find a selection of them. So some of them, like we mentioned, to read the Torah three times a week. The exact text of the first blessing of the Berkat Amazon, the grace after meals, that was codified by Moshe. The seven days of mourning. Someone, God forbid, loses a relative. Seven days of mourning. That comes from an ordinance of Moshe, seven days, on the flip side, of celebration after a wedding. was called the Sheva Brachos. That is the work of Moshe. Other examples, to study the laws of a festival, 30 days before that festival, that is a ubiquitous custom that was enacted by Moshe. And there are many others that we won't detail because it is quite vast, but we see that this already gets started all the way at the very beginning, Moshe is alive, Moshe is still giving us Torah, Moshe is still giving us the 40 years of transmission of Torah, the Sinaitic Torah, and he's already incorporating rabbinic law, mosaic law, if you will, and he's giving us decrees and ordinances. Now, these decrees and ordinances actually comprise a very large part of what we call Torah and Judaism today. And even though the rabbi, the leader of the generation, is given a lot of latitude and flexibility in determining what they choose to focus on, what decrees, what ordinances to make, the Talmud tells us that we don't make a decree upon the public unless at least the majority can withstand it. So this is not going to be draconian. It's going to be things that people accept make sense with people, and people are able to do it. If it's too hard, it's not done. In fact, we'll talk about this a little bit later. There were decrees that historically were made that because the public refused to accept it, it actually did not become binding. It's only when the leader makes a decree and the nation, it really resonates with them, and then it's adopted by everyone, only then does it get incorporated into rabbinic law and oral Torah? So Moshe is spending 40 years giving us the Almighty's Torah with all the details, and he's also adding selected rabbinic law, and that's the course of these 40 years. Now, it is quite interesting that there were a few laws that Moshe actually forgot along the way. So, for example, the law that daughters inherit the ancestral land in Israel, in the event that a man bears no sons. This is in Numbers chapter 27. We have a gentleman by the name of Slavchad, and he has five daughters and no sons, and he dies before the conquest of Canaan. And we know that the ancestral land goes from father to son. Well, what if there are no sons? Does it go to daughters? That was the question that was posed to Moshe. 
and Moshe did not know the law. And he had to go to God to discover this law. And actually, the Talmud tells us there were several laws that Moshe actually forgot. He, he knew them, but he forgot them. And those are really interesting episodes to study to understand exactly why Moshe forgot it, and that is discussed in the Talmud. But this is really interesting. This is like a, a, a glitch in the system. Right? Moshe has given us Torah, and suddenly a question is posed to him, and he doesn't know the answer. So what does he do? He goes to God. And God says to him, you know what? The daughters of Tzlavchad are making a good argument. And indeed, in the event that a man has no sons, and he has just daughters, the daughters inherit the ancestral land. But what's interesting about this is that this is only going to apply during Moshe's lifetime. Because Moshe is the one who is conveying Torah. He is the originator. He is that link, that Sinaitic link between God and the Jewish people. When he doesn't know a law, he's able to go to God. Once Moshe passes, that get-out-of-jail-free card, that easy answer, cheating on the test, going to God, is going to be eliminated. And that's going to create the challenge of Torah. How do we perpetuate Torah? With, of course, 613 mitzvos, but each one of them is, is categories with thousands of mitzvos within them, and myriad manifold laws over the course of generations, living in all kinds of difficult situations, how are we going to patch the Amadi's Torah without the fallback option of let's just go ask God? And that's going to really dominate Jewish history, really essentially until today, this quest to maintain the accuracy in the perpetuation of the Torah. Even Moshe made a mistake of Moshe, the most infallible that we get is still fallible. We're going to have to wrestle and contend with the fact that mistakes happen, we are fallible, and what exactly is the protocol when mistakes happen or when things are forgotten, that's going to be a very important subject of Jewish history. But for the most part, the nation spent 40 years in continuous state of study until his passing. What happened after Moses' death? What now? So there's a very informative teaching in the Talmud. And this, again, reveals the nature and the challenge of the transmission of Torah. This is found in the book of Timura, page 16a. It tells us that over the course of the mourning period of Moshe, 3,000 laws were forgotten. And the people rush to Joshua. He, of course, is the appointed successor. And they say to him, okay, ask God. We have to know the answer. We don't have Moshe here. You're in charge. Go ask God. Isn't that what Moshe did? So Joshua responds to them, quoting the verse in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Lo b'shamayim he. Torah is no longer in the heavens. We can no longer go up to heaven, page God, and find the answer. And the Talmud says that there were still questions that festered over the course of generations. and. Even hundreds of years later, the nation went to Samuel. Of course, Samuel, a prophet, par excellence, according to some opinions of the Talmud, equal to Moses and Aaron. And they say to him the same question, go ask God. And he responds, no, I can't do it. They go to Pinchas, go ask God. And he says, no, it's not in the heavens. They say to Elazar, these are all the leaders of the Jewish people, go ask God. And he says, no, this is not in the hands of the prophets. Now, the Talmud diverges to explain why it was forgotten. It was forgotten because before Moshe's death, we know the entire book of Deuteronomy happens the month before Moshe passes. And he is encouraging the nation. He's berating the nation. He's trying to prepare the nation for the challenges ahead. The Talmud tells us that when Moshe was about to die, he goes over to Joshua and he says to him, ask me any question, any doubt, I will resolve it for you. And Joshua responds, almost hubristically, Did I ever abandon you? Wasn't I always at your side? Didn't you yourself write in your Torah in Exodus chapter 33 that Joshua, Moshe's attendant, did not depart from the tent even for a second? 
So Joshua's saying, I've been, I've been here the, all the way. I don't need anything. Whatever you know, I know. And because he made Moshe feel bad, therefore he forgot all these laws. And the Talmud goes on to say that the people were not happy with Joshua, not one little bit. And they wanted to kill him. And as a diversion, God says to Joshua, I can't reveal to you the answer. Torah is not in the heavens. But I could cause a diversion. Let's go busy the nation with war of conquest of Canaan so they won't kill you because you forgot the law. And the Talmud goes on to say that Asniel ben Kenaz, he is an important figure in Jewish history, he's one of the first judges, first leaders of the Jewish people in the time of Joshua, but then also succeeding Joshua, with his logic and with his study and with his immersion of Torah, was able to restore a lot of the laws that were lost. So this fascinating Talmud, I think it reveals the challenge of the transmission of the Torah. It has to be done by fallible humans, and you cannot rely on prophecy. Torah is no longer in the heavens. And what happens if laws are forgotten? Well, it is a great calamity. We're losing the greatest gift in human history, the Almighty's Torah. And the people, perhaps justly, wanted to kill Joshua. But the Talmud concludes with an empowering idea. That with the force of our logic and study, it is possible for us to restore what was lost. So this is demonstrating how the transmission of the Torah is somewhat getting off onto a rocky start, right with the death of Moshe. Immediately, we're plunged into the challenge that has faced our nation since that time. Now, Joshua, like Moses before him, also innovated, also added rabbinic law, also added decrees and ordinances. So, for example, if Moshe, he codified the text of the first blessing of the Berkat Amazon, Joshua is the author of the second blessing of Berkat Amazon. The prayer, Aleinu L'Shabeach, that we say at the end of the prayer, that is the work of Joshua. And the Talmud also adds, of course, Joshua was responsible for the division of the land. So now everyone is living on their own land. What to do with neighbors? So there's 10 different enactments that, that Joshua did to ensure that people are having good neighbor relations. Like, can I walk into your field? Can you walk into my field? Can I cut your grass? Can you cut my grass? What if my animal raises in your field? All those laws, there were 10 enactments that Joshua did to smooth out the process of now living in a land, each person in their own ancestral parcel of land. But this is interesting. Joshua is making innovations. Obviously, these were good ideas, and these were accepted by the entire Jewish people. But if they're good ideas, why didn't Moshe do it? If it's a good idea, Moshe should have done it. If it's not a good idea, well, then why did Joshua do it? And this is, I think, the portal to try to understand an, another very central component of Torah. And to introduce it, I want to kind of raise the states. I want to compound the question by quoting some citations from the Talmud. So we mentioned earlier that Moshe's acceptance of Torah was really complete. In fact, the Talmud, the book of Brachos, page 5a, tells us that on the doorstep of Sinai, when Moshe about to go up the mountain, God says, I'm going to give you the stone tablets. That means, says the Talmud, Ten Commandments. And I'm going to give you the Torah. That means the text of Scripture. And I'm going to give you the mitzvah. That's a reference to the Mishnah, the laws. That I wrote, that is a reference to the prophets and the writings. To instruct them, that is a reference to the Talmud, concludes this citation. This teaches us that all of these, the stone tablets, scripture, the Mishnah, the Talmud, and the writings of the prophets were all given to Moses at Sinai. Ergo, Moshe knew things that came even after his death. 
The Talmud elsewhere, the book of Medilla, page 19b, quotes a different verse. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10, where it talks about what was written upon the tablets. It says as follows. This teaches us that God showed Moshe all the inferences of Torah, all the inferences of the sages, all the novel insights of future sages, including the Medilla. The Medilla, Medilla's Esther, the book of Esther we read on Purim, to commemorate events that happened in the 4th century before the Common Era, so almost a thousand years after Moshe's passing, Moshe knew about that as well. Moshe's knowledge was totally comprehensive. Another source, this is from the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud, in the book of Peya, chapter 2, law number 4. And what this citation tells us is that even what a veteran student is going to innovate in front of their teacher, that too was given to Moshe at Sinai. So these sources indicate that there was no innovation that was not known to Moshe. His revelation of Torah was complete. It included everything that came subsequently. Yet we see that Joshua did innovate. There was something that Moshe apparently didn't know, didn't do. And to make matters worse, the Talmud, the book of Shavuos, page 39a, it's talking about what Moshe was telling the Jewish people right before he passed. So he gathered them together. This is in chapter 29 of Deuteronomy. And he made a covenant with the nation. And he tells them, I'm not just making a covenant with you. I'm making a covenant with you and your future descendants, whoever's standing here with us today and whoever's not standing with us today. And the Talmud says that includes future generations and future converts. They too are grandfathered in to this Mosaic covenant. And then it adds, Moshe makes this covenant binding the Jewish people to adherence to Torah, but not just to the Torah that existed then, to the Torah that came subsequently. And the example the Talmud gives is the reading of the Medilla. When Moshe, again, a few days before his passing, when he gathers the nation, says, you have to keep Torah, and that's our deal, that's our covenant. He was actually referring to rabbinic law that came a thousand years hence. This is really interesting. In one Talmud, we're told, Moshe knew everything. And the example of the things that he knew was the reading of the Megillah, a mitzvah again that commemorates events that happened nearly millennium after Moshe's passing. The second source is describing the mitzvah of the Megillah as something that is futuristic, that was not present at the time, but was developed later. Which one is it? And finally, the most difficult source on this subject is found in the book of Talmud in Menachos, page 29b. This is a very difficult citation of the Talmud for more than one reason, and I believe we have mentioned it in the past. It's telling what happened to Moshe when he ascended Mount Sinai the first time to get the Torah. Right after the revelation, Ten Commandments, goes up the mountain, he's going to spend 40 days and 40 nights getting the details of the Torah. And he sees the Almighty making crownlets and jotlets above the letters. And he says, why are you doing that? Why are you embellishing the Torah this way? So God tells Moshe, well, there's going to be a man in many generations. And his name is Rabbi Akiva. And he's going to take every crownlet, every jot and tittle of the Torah, and going to derive piles and piles of laws from every jot and tittle. So Moshe is fascinated by this. And he says to God, let me see him. Give me a vision of Rabbi Akiva. And instantly, Moshe is put into the time machine and is transported 1,500 years into the future, and he's sitting in the lecture hall of Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Akiva is giving a lecture to his students, and Moshe does not understand what's going on. And he gets sad. He gets depressed. And then he's listening to this lecture, and then the students are asking Rabbi Akiva questions, and they ask him, where do you source this particular law? 
So he responds, this is a halacha l'Moshe Messina. This is a law that comes from Moshe at Sinai. And when Moshe hears that, right away he is appeased, he is assuaged, he is mollified. He's happy. He goes back to God, and now he's been so impressed, so wowed by the Torah prowess of Rabbi Tiva. He says, okay, show me his reward. And the Almighty quizzically shows Rabbi Tiva being tortured in a horrific and macabre fashion. He goes back to God and says, this is Torah, and this is its reward. And God says to him, quiet, you don't understand. But one of the most difficult problems with this story is that Moshe, ostensibly the bastion of all knowledge, of all Torah knowledge, he is sitting in Rabbi Kiva's lecture hall, and Rabbi Kiva's giving a lecture, and Moshe does not understand what they're saying. How can we say, on one hand, that Moshe is a repository of all Torah knowledge, yet he's sitting in Rabbi Kiva's Torah lecture, and he does not know what Rabbi Kiva is saying? So what I'm trying to convey here is that there seems to be a contradiction in the sources between Moshe's comprehensive knowledge of Torah and the fact that something else was added later. How can it be? Is it all for Moshe? Is it something came later? Or how do we reconcile these apparent conflicts? And I think that there are several answers and they are not necessarily mutually exclusive. But this question, I think, does maybe get to the heart of the dynamism of Torah over the generation. So an answer that I had, I think it's an easy answer. The Talmud starts off by saying that when Moshe goes up to heaven, he sees God writing a Torah scroll, making crownlets. So Moshe's there for 40 days. And at what point in the 40 days is this episode happening? It seems to be that this is when Moshe goes up. Maybe that's day one, day two, it's at the beginning. Maybe at the end of the 40 days, when Moshe got the whole Torah, maybe by then he would have known what Rabbi Kiva was expounding. But this is at the beginning of the duration of the 40 days, and consequently he didn't know that yet. In fact, there is sources in the Talmud that Moshe was taught Torah and he forgot it, and he was taught and he forgot it, and only at the end it was given to him as a gift. So maybe at this juncture of the 40 days, he didn't know it. I think that's an easy answer. It doesn't really help us to try to build out our understanding of Torah, but I think it's an easy answer to to, just to reconcile that particular teaching in the Talmud. There's another answer that is found in the Ar HaChaim, one of the great commentators on Torah. This is in Leviticus chapter 13, verse 37. And he gives us a very wonderful insight. He says, of course, Moshe knew it all. And there is nothing that Rabbi Tiva knew that any future sage knew above what Moshe knew. If you were to collect all the insights, all the information that all the future generations had and bundle it all together, there's nothing that Moshe didn't know amongst that. But the format of Moshe's knowledge was different than what was innovated in the future. Moshe, he had oral Torah, he had written Torah. But the connections between the two, the links between the two, how these two are mirror images in totally different formats, that was not given as a gift, so to speak, to Moshe. That is left for future generations. The job of the Jewish people is to understand how these two bodies, these two corpuses of Torah are identical and to try to discover the roots of oral Torah in the written Torah. And he goes on to elaborate. The Tanoim, the authors of the Mishnah, they wrote all these books and their books are to try to connect the laws of the oral Torah with the text of the written Torah. That is our job until today to see the the unity, the synergy of Torah, and that was not given completely to Moshe. So Rabbi Kiva's expounding, he's teaching. What's he teaching? He's teaching on the this this other vector, so to speak, of Torah knowledge. Not that Moshe did not know the laws or the text, and not that there's any information that is beyond Moshe. 
all the information that came up, all the laws that come up even in the future, Moshe knew, but the connection and the unity, so to speak, of written Torah and old Torah, that is what Moshe was lacking, and that's the job given to future generations. This is, I think, a, a powerful insight that, again, shows how both statements can be true. Moshe knew it all. We can still innovate because there is still room that is carved out for us. So these perspectives, I think, really help us understand what role the sages are playing over the course of the centuries. They're not just guardians of the Oral Torah. The Oral Torah is actually dynamic. It's going to be innovated. They're going to add upon it. They're going to discover parts of it. They're going to teach parts of it. There's going to be discoveries that are still available today. And that's why the publishing industry in the Torah world is gargantuan. You know, the amount of people that are studying Torah, it's very small. We're studying Torah at a very deep, advanced level. It's very small. Yet the amount of publishing that gets done in this sector is astronomical. Why? Because the Torah is infinite. The Torah, and even Moshe didn't know all of Torah. Moshe knew as much as a human can know. But only God knows it all. Because only God is infinite. And therefore, there is still room for innovation. There are still books that can be written. There are still insights that can be discovered. Of course, Moshe knew them all, but there's still room for us to discover. When we talk about transmitting of Torah, it's more than just conveying principles verbatim from Moshe. It's not dry, it's alive, it's dynamic, and it's going to evolve over time within certain parameters. And Moshe, of course, gave us a complete Torah, and we argue that, of course, with the additions that were added, the decrees and the ordinances, the laws over the years, we believe that we still have the exact Torah, the core at least, that we got from Moshe. There were stuff that were added over the, over the course of the centuries, but we still have it today. So Moshe innovated some laws, of course, within his jurisdiction, within his mandate, within the power vested in him by God. Joshua did the same. And these laws joined the main body of oral Torah. They were publicized. They were disseminated throughout the nation. And they joined the corpus of oral Torah that was transmitted from generation to generation. The Torah, again, is still in a written Torah. It's entirely written. In fact, you cannot read the written Torah by heart. And then with oral Torah, it's entirely oral, and you cannot teach the oral Torah from a book, and they're concurrently being transmitted accurately from generation to generation. And of course, this raises skepticism, And this raises questions, how do we know that we did a good job? What is the nature of Torah from Moses to the Mishnah, from Moses until the codification of the oral Torah? Moshe, at the end of his life, the Torah tells us, he gives the written Torah, or copies of the written Torah, to the Jewish people. The Talmud tells us that he actually wrote 13 Torah scrolls. He gave one to each of the 12 tribes, and a 13th scroll was kept for posterity in the Ark, in the Holy of Holies, together with many other important items, such as the tablets, both the tablets that were destroyed and the other tablets, and many other things, like the vial of manna, Aaron's staff that bloomed with almonds. And whenever there was a question, whenever there was a dispute as to how to spell a word, Whenever there was discrepancies between two Torah scrolls, you would always have the fallback. You just go back to Moshe's Torah scroll. That we know for sure is accurate. And you check to see which one of your versions is indeed true. Every tribe had their Torah scroll. And all the scribes from that particular tribe would use that as the source scroll to make their scroll. So they would copy from that one. And because it's distributed, every tribe has their own scroll. And occasionally, over the course of our history, they would gather all the Torah scrolls and compare them and weed out mistakes that inevitably fell into the text. And therefore, we can be assured that the text of the Torah that we have today is indeed the text that Moshe gave us. In fact, if you compare it to other religions, other religions have in their texts hundreds of thousands of variations 
And the most you would find in any two Torah scrolls, the most that they would differ is in nine letters, which out of 304,805 letters is infinitesimally tiny. But even those nine letters, they are what's called chaserot and yeserot, meaning they are letters that are vowels. Sometimes the vowels appear in a word. Sometimes they don't appear in a word. And therefore, even those nine discrepancies do not change a word. And this, of course, is great testament to the fact that the written Torah was indeed perpetuated accurately. In fact, in the 20th century, they found versions of the Torah scrolls that were 2,000 years old. And of course, everyone is gleefully ready to show how we have altered all kinds of stuff over the course of the centuries and millennia. But then they actually took pictures of it, and they were precisely, exactly like the Torah scrolls we have today. So if we've done 2,000 years perpetuating the Torah, the written Torah, accurately, even though we've been scattered throughout the world, even though we've been subject to all kinds, all manners of persecution, and we don't have access to Moshe's original 13 Torah scrolls, it's safe to assume, it would be quite logical and reasonable to say that indeed the Torah that we have today, the text written Torah, is 100% accurate and is the one that Moshe delivered to the Jewish people on the day of his passing. That's an easier subject. What about the Oral Torah? How was the Oral Torah, which again, we don't have anything physical to ensure accuracy, how was that transmitted accurately? And the question that people always ask, or certainly people that have less familiarity with Torah, the question that they ask is, well, have you never played the game of telephone? Don't you know if you have to pass information, it gets distorted, it gets changed, and the longer the chain is, the more it gets distorted? And that's a silly question. Not because it's a silly subject, it's a very important subject, but of course, the game of telephone and how Torah is being transmitted could not be more different. And I want to say, by way of introduction, the question of how we transmitted Torah accurately, oral Torah accurately, I think it's mostly a product of our microscopic standards of Torah scholarship. We have very low standards today. I wonder what percentage of the Jewish people can actually name just the name of the 54 partios in the Torah. What percentage of our nation actually knows the names of Bracious Noah, Lachavayer, Chaisara, Toldus Vayetze, the 54 names of the sections of the Torah? If you do it, you're probably part of the 1%. That's our standards of scholarship today. Historically, we have had tremendously high standards of scholarship. Talmud tells us, Book of Kedushin, page 30a, Vishinantem, this is from the Shema, you should teach Torah to your children, explains the Talmud, if someone asks you a Torah question, what is demanded of every Jew is to respond immediately, to have such clarity of knowledge of Torah, to not have to even file, go find that file in your head, or Google it, to know it right away. Of course, that's a high standard that we maybe strive to attain. And that was standard centuries ago. But even today, I personally know people that know it all instantly. I have an uncle, my father's sister's husband. He made it his mission as a very young man to be the rabbi that knows it all instantly without fumbling. And the story behind that is interesting. He was once at a wedding. And there were many rabbis who were in attendance. And the father of the groom had a heart attack and died under the chuppah, under the wedding canopy. And he said that the rabbis were so flustered by this. What do we do now? That he couldn't believe it. He's like, wait, there's, there's rabbis here. and They don't know right away what to do. I'm going to be the rabbi that does know always instantly what to do without having to research it. And my uncle is a rabbi in Israel. And he's not the most famous rabbi. He's not the most renowned rabbi. He is a rabbi. And yet, you can read any page of Talmud. Any page of Talmud. Open up. A, a, he'll, he'll turn around. You open up any one of the 36 books. And you read from any one of the 2,711 pages. And you read any line. And I'll tell you what page of Talmud's on. And there are hundreds of people just like him. I think if the people who ask 
the telephone question, if they knew people like him, they wouldn't be so flippant about as if Torah is this one thing that you say quickly, you mutter into your friend's ear, and it's going to easily be forgotten. The standards of Torah scholarship that we have had historically, and even still exist to some extent today, are a lot higher than these questioners. The Rambam, he is famous for telling us that everyone has to work. Don't just be a Torah scholar who studies Torah and relies on the largesse of the public. You have to work. But how much should you work and how much should you study Torah? The Ram says you should study Torah for nine hours a day and you should work for three hours a day and the other 12 hours do all the other things you need to do. This is the Ramah. I'm talking about a working person. Certainly, if this was the standard, can you imagine? Again, for someone who's not a Torah scholar, who's not a sage, if the average person is studying nine hours of Torah a day, would we have a problem transmitting the oral Torah accurately? I would imagine not. So I think that's the first perspective to adopt when trying to navigate the question of how was Torah perpetuated accurately over the course of the millennia. Moreover, what is being transmitted? It's not ideas divorced from reality. It's not something, some secret that no one knows, some arcane insight some esoteric principle that no one really knows, and you're the guardian of that principle, you pass it over to the next generation. You're transmitting a way of life. Torah is the instruction that might give us that we are maintaining, that we are doing, that we are practicing, not some story or some discreet idea. How do we know that when you get to a green light, you're supposed to go, and when you get to a red light, you're supposed to stop? Is this something that you read in a book? You imagine it's not something you read in a book. It's it's life. Everyone knows that. My kids know that. My four-year-old son knows that. Maybe even my one-year-old daughter knows that. I don't know. I have to ask her. Everyone knows when it's a green light, you go. When it's a red light, you stop. Every Jewish child knows that daddy has tzitzis on his garment that you're supposed to kiss. And every child knows that on Shabbos we don't flip on the lights. And every child knows that on circus we sit in the sukkah. And on Pesach we eat matzah. And the highest ideal of Jewish living, the greatest pastime of the Jewish people, is to study Torah. Every child knows that. It's alive. It's not like we're transmitting ideas. We're living it. And a Jewish child who is fortunate enough to be surrounded in a Torah environment they absorb it from the first day they are born. And another point, this is the national mission of the Jewish people. The national mission of the Jewish people is to perpetuate Torah throughout the generations and to maintain the accuracy of Torah despite all the tribulations that we may endure as a nation. This is not some word, some message that you're trying to say it as quickly and as most, you know, in the most garbled fashion as possible to try to see how crazy the idea could evolve over the course of 30 kids. If the objective is to transmit it accurately, then it's more likely to be perpetuated accurately. And you know what? How many generations have there been from Moses to the Mishnah? It's actually not that long. There's only 40 generations from Moses to the end of the Talmud, which is about 300 years after the Mishnah. So it's roughly around 30 generations. 30 generations where the greatest minds in human history focused solely on study of Torah, or primarily on study of Torah, the most important national mission of the Jewish people to perpetuate accurately. Can't you imagine that it would be done well or perfectly? Is that too much of a stretch to ask? But there's another important point. There is a body, there is an institution whose goal, whose reason why they exist is to quickly resolve any discrepancies or disputes. And that, of course, is the Sanhedrin. And this is a body that is established by Moses himself. We read in the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verse 16, God tells Moshe, gather 70 elders. And this is the forebearer of the Sanhedrin. 
70 elders plus Moshe, we have 71 elders. And this body is going to be extant until the middle of the 4th century of the Common Era. For a stunning 1,700 years, almost uninterrupted, we're going to have the Sanhedrin. And they're going to be there to weed out mistakes, to mitigate mistakes, and to establish halacha. Whenever there's a dispute, whenever there's an uncertainty, you go to the Sanhedrin, and they are the guardians. They are the last word of oral Torah, and any question is resolved by them. And in fact, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 17, when a matter is hidden from you, between blood and blood, between law and law, between nega, which means like a like a, like an affliction and an affliction, matters of dispute in your towns. You don't know something. Rabbi A says one thing, Rabbi B says another thing. There's uncertainty. There is ignorance of a given matter. Vekamta Velisa, you should get up and ascend to the place, i.e. to Jerusalem, where God chose, and you go. And you speak to the elders, to the priests, to the Levites, to the judges that exist in that day. And you'll study the matter, and they'll give you a ruling, and you must obey that ruling. And if you don't obey that ruling, if you depart from the ruling right or left, that person who refuses to accept the ruling is actually going to be executed. If there is a renegade sage, if there is a recalcitrant judge who refuses to accept the ruling of Sanhedrin, they are liable to be executed. So we have a body, the Sanhedrin. They are the safety measure to ensure that mistakes, if they do happen, they're not likely to happen, but if they do, we have a way to resolve the problems. And, of course, in the absolute majority of instances, the questions would not reach the great Sanhedrin. You asked your friends, you asked your local rabbi, you asked the lower courts, and even in the Sanhedrin itself, the complex of the temple, there were two lower courts, and most likely they would be resolved there. And if not, you come to Sanhedrin, and their ruling is law. The question is a legitimate question. How was oral Torah perpetuated throughout the years? And we see it's not so simple for us to take the infantile position, well, game of telephone, it's distorted in a million different ways. Oh no, it was actually transmitted quite accurately. We would argue perfectly accurately, accurately throughout the generations. And if there were mistakes, that might not be somebody like we'll talk about in the future. But we do get something really interesting. There are no records of mistakes or misunderstandings until right before the Mishnah was written. In fact, the Talmud of the Book of Sanhedrin, page 94b, tells us that there was a great national census in the time of King Chistio, the 13th king of Judah. This is at the time where Chistio was being threatened by Sancherib, the king of the Assyrians. And Chistia was worried that the reason why they were under threat was due to the fact that they had been a little bit negligent in, in study of Torah. He took a sword, and he went to the house of scholarship, and he made a threat. He says, if you don't study Torah, I'm going to kill you. And then they made a census from Dan to Beersheba, and they did not find a single ignoramus. And they did not find a young boy or even a young girl, a man or a woman, that was not a total expert in the laws of purity and impurity. So again, we have this tremendous period of time where mistakes are just not appearing because the system is so tight, it's so strong, the culture of Torah study, the immersion of Torah study, and all the safety measures that are in place and all Torah is being perpetuated accurately. And in addition, way before the actual writing of the Mishnah, the canonization of the Oral Torah, or even the canonization of the Tanakh, of the Jewish Bible, there were some efforts to begin to codify Oral Torah. So, for example, every leader of every generation, and of course, every student, had notes, maintained voluminous notes. And again, Oral Torah, you have to teach it orally, you're not allowed to publicly use your notes. You're not allowed to disseminate your notes as authoritative oral Torah. 
But this system of note building and making sure that you're including every new insight, every new understanding, every new connection between written Torah and oral Torah, every new decree and ordinance, every new decision rendered by the Sanhedrin, this note building actually created a tremendous body of written oral Torah. It wasn't codified, but it's going to be crucial for the eventual writing of the Mishnah many centuries hence. I read at the very beginning, at the time of Joshua and the time of the judges, that process begins in earnest. Moreover, there was an intensive effort to organize and to systematize Torah. And the benefit of this is is tremendous. You know, the Torah, it's distributed, of course, over the five books of the Torah. But the oral Torah, there's a lot of details that are not necessarily organized. So we're told in the Talmud, this is the Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud, Shkalem, chapter 5, law number 1, it quotes a verse in, in Chronicles that talks about a family of counters. What does it mean, a family of counters? This was a family that their innovation in oral Torah was to try to organize it and to say, okay, there are five people, for example, that cannot separate truma. What this means is they're taking various laws that may be distributed, scattered throughout oral Torah and putting it into place and giving it a number and putting it in a box, making it more memorizable, making it more organized, making it more accessible, making it easier to perpetuate. There's five people that cannot bring truma. There's five things that are needed in challah. There's 15 women that are so prohibited to their yavam that they actually absolve their co-wives. And these, by the way, are all included in the Mishnah. There's 36 prohibitions of the Torah that have within it the punishment of Croesus. There are four general categories of personal damages. There are 40 minus 1 things that are prohibited on Shabbos. Again, they're giving numbers and organizing things to make it easier to perpetuate. This is, of course, going to be included in the codification of the Oral Torah. But again, we see the, the early nascent efforts to begin to make Oral Torah more digestible for the common folk. So we have Torah being perpetuated, Torah being organized, and in every generation, the leaders of the generation and their courts are adding decrees and ordinances, again, as sanctioned by the Torah, within the jurisdiction, within the power vested in the Torah, in the Sanhedrin, in the requirement to make fences, etc. So, a quick sampling of these laws that were added to the oral Torah throughout generations. Boaz, he is one of the judges. He instituted, for example, the greeting of Shalom which is one of the names of God, that's how you greet a fellow Jew. That comes from Boaz. There's all kinds of prayers that are added to liturgy over the course of the centuries. That itself could be its own subject that we could talk about. Samuel, he's the one who promulgated the law that a non-Kohen may slaughter sacrifices. Some have suggested, in fact, that this is one of the laws that was forgotten during Moses' passing. It was Samuel's court that finally settled the question of a female Ammonite and Moabite convert. He was the one who made sure, finally, that David indeed is allowed to be incorporated the Jewish people, even though his great-grandmother, Ruth, was a Moabite convert. And he was the one who differentiated between male and female converts. Male converts cannot marry the Jewish people, male Ammonite and Moabite converts, that is, whereas females can. David's court, they added prayers and blessings. The fact that there are 100 blessings that we're supposed to say every day, that comes from David. Yichud, the law prohibiting the seclusion of a man with a woman other than his wife, that too came from David's court. In the times of Solomon, the laws of Eruv were developed. The additional relatives not prohibited by the Torah, that came also in the times of Solomon. They were added as a protective fence to the Torah-prohibited relationships. The fact that we say the Kohanic blessing, this is, of course, the three verses in Numbers that the priests are supposed to pray and bless the Jewish people, that was installed in daily prayers in the times of Solomon. The aforementioned King Chizkiah, he decreed that idols render ritual impurity. When Sancherib encircled Jerusalem, 
he composed the prayer that we still say today. So again, we we're running through centuries and we're talking about some of the great leaders. Of course, there are many, many more themes and decrees and ordinances that we did not include, but that gives a little bit of a flavor of what themes were like. And then, of course, the temple is destroyed. And that is a major threat to Jewish continuity. Jewish people led into exile, into Babylon, and it takes 70 years. Over the course of 70 years, we have the Purim story. And finally, a small group of Jews go back to Israel to rebuild the temple, what's known as the Second Commonwealth, the Second Temple. At this juncture, we have a very important body called the Men of the Great Assembly. This is a temporarily expanded Sanhedrin at this very critical juncture in our history. We have the temple. It's being rebuilt. But the second temple is not going to have all the accoutrements of the first temple. The second temple is going to be a shell of its former glory. The Jews are scattered. Prophecy is waning. There are existential threats facing our nation. And this body is going to make pivotal innovations that endure until today. So the formalized prayer, that came from the men of the Great Assembly. They restored the verbiage of the prayers that were changed by Jeremiah and by Daniel. Jeremiah and Daniel actually edited some of the prayers, and that was restored by the men of the Great Assembly. The Festival of Purim. That was instituted by the men of the Great Assembly. The finalization of the canon to include the recently written Book of Esther as the 24th book, that was done by the men of the Great Assembly. There are no longer any more books that can be added to the canon. Ezra is one of the heads of this Great Assembly. In fact, it's considered to be his court. And he's the author of 10 decrees. I don't want to go through them all, but for example, the reading of the Torah on Shabbos by Mincha, the fact that when we read the Torah on Mondays and Thursdays, it has to be three aliyos with a minimum of three verses apiece. And this is found in the Talmud book of Baba Kama, a list of all the ten degrees that were enacted by Ezra. Some of them sound really interesting. Like, for example, Ezra decreed that there have to be merchants who travel from town to town selling jewelry and selling perfume to make sure that women have access to those items and make them more desirable by their husbands and therefore maintain marital harmony. So we have, again, this process, the system given to us by Moshe, and it's being done throughout the generations, making sure that Torah is being maintained, if necessary, adding decrees and ordinances, and perpetuating Torah to future generations. Now, what happens when there is the decree? Is there any way to have it rescinded? Is there any way to take an existing decree and undoing it, and annulling it? That's a very interesting question. So the Talmud tells us that a court cannot annul the decree of a second court unless it is greater than the first court in number and in wisdom. So if you want to have a second court that undoes the ruling of the first court, they have to be equal or greater in scholarship and stature to the first court. So if we wanted to get rid of some of these decrees, we would not be able to do it because we have no court today that is anywhere near the size and the scholarship of any of these previous courts. However, there is another way that a decree can be annulled, and that is if it was not accepted by all of Israel. So the Talmud, for example, tells us that Daniel, he made a decree against wine of non-Jews. He didn't want Jews frolicking with non-Jews. And therefore he said, okay, if the wine was touched by a non-Jew, can't drink from it. And that was a way to keep the Jewish people separate and unique. But he also made a decree against oil of the non-Jews. And the Talmud says, wait a minute, future generations were using Gentile oil. 
So if Daniel made a decree against wine and oil, how come future generations were maintaining the decree against the wine, but not against the oil? The Talmud says, because this decree against Gentile oil was not accepted amongst the majority of Israel, and therefore it really never had any grounds. And this again reveals to us that there are some checks, there are some limitations on what a Jewish court and a Jewish sage can enact if it's not accepted by all of Israel or by the majority of Israel, then it really doesn't ever get off. I want to point out an interesting example of this. The Talmud says that there was a decree against listening to music. Why? Because ever since the temple was destroyed, it's improper for us to be joyous. It's improper for us to listen to music. I happen to not like music because I don't like it. But there's no religious requirement or prohibition against listening to music. It's it's astonishingly rare to find someone that refrains from listening to music, even though Talmud says explicitly you cannot listen to music. After the temple is destroyed, how could you have any joy? And the reason why this decree never really got started is because it wasn't accepted by the Jewish people. And therefore, it's not forbidden. This will be similar to Daniel's oil decree. It never got off the ground because it was never accepted by the Jewish people. During the three weeks between the 17th day of Tammuz and the 9th day of Av, days of mourning, we actually do refrain from music, not because it's a new decree, but because there is such an intensity of the feeling of mourning over the temple being destroyed during these weeks. Therefore, the Jewish nation has accepted the prohibition against music during these three weeks. And finally, there is a third way for a decree to be rescinded, and that if it was a temporary decree, such as the prohibition against moving nearly anything that was instituted by Nehemiah, that is uh, Ezra's counterpart. This is told in the book of Shabbos, page 123b. He made a prohibition against moving items on Shabbos because he felt the people were being a little bit too lax with touching things on Shabbos. And they weren't focusing on what Shabbos really is all about. And they were touching things that were prohibited. He says, okay, don't touch anything. And then once people kind of went to one extreme and they became more meticulous and fastidious about Torah law and about Shabbos, he says, okay, now we can loosen up restrictions because it was only a temporary decree. So this brings us a lot closer to, to modern times. We have about a thousand years from Moshe until the men of the Great Assembly. We have a system that works very, very well, almost perfectly. And in fact, we don't find any mistakes, any any disputes, any disagreements within the nation from the time of Moshe until the men of the Great Assembly and the beginning of the Second Commonwealth. And at this juncture, things are okay. There are going to be several issues that are going to crop up. We're going to have a major movement, starts off small, but mushrooms out of control, of people that begin to contest rabbinic law and oral Torah. They are known as the Sadducees, and they become a growing body of Jews that reject this system. Moreover, we're going to have the nation being controlled by very hostile foreign leaders. And we're going to have systematic efforts to stop Torah from flourishing. We're going to have vacuums of leadership. We're going to have periods of tremendous unrest. And of course, we're going to have the destruction of the Second Temple. And all these factors that, please God, we'll discuss next time are going to lead to maybe, arguably, the most important the most consequential decision of of all of Jewish history, they're going to lead to the writing down or the beginning of the writing down of the Mishnah and the Oral Torah. And of course, that's going to lead to the writing down of the Talmud. And that's going to change how Torah and Oral Torah is going to be studied. But that's the subject of, of our next discussion to understand, okay, we got basically unscathed from Moshe 
to the men of the Great Assembly, what now? How do we go? Or what are the factors that are going to contribute to the writing of the Mishnah? How was that done? What is this process of trying to assimilate all of oral Torah and organize it into six or three different books? Who are the personalities? What are the struggles that they faced? What were the first disputes that actually happened? There was one dispute that lingered for hundreds of years, and it wasn't resolved until many, many centuries after it was raised. We're going to talk about the splitting of the academy into the academy of Shammai and to the academy of Hillel. And how did that contribute towards this grave need of Torah being codified and formalized and canonized? So those are some of the discussions that we will have, please God, next time. As always, my email address is rabbiwalbajim.com. I look forward to hearing any questions, any comments, any feedback of any kind. I deeply appreciate it.